God wants to make sure of, and that is that we all understand what ministry really is and what God's mind is about his people or toward his people. I've been in Bible teachers for almost 30 years. October will be 30 years. We're celebrating 30 years of, of ministry. And before, well, in the early stages of the ministry, the very earliest, the Lord, the Lord visited me. And gave me a revelation of ministry. And I remember at that first visitation when I saw him, I, you, you've heard me testify of it a lot of times, many times, how he, I saw him walking across my swimming pool and just walking on the water and then walk through the wall. Well, in that encounter, the Lord let me know that I was going to minister uh, globally around the world, he said, international, this will be an international ministry, and that I would minister to dignitaries and heads of nations, heads of state. And um, since then, God has brought that vision to pass. The ministry is an international ministry. But I remember saying to the Lord, I remember saying to the Lord, I said, Lord, um, I don't love your people the way I'm supposed to love your people if I'm going to be a minister like that. And I probably will fail because I don't have that kind of love. And, and if I'm to love like that, you're going to have to teach me how to love your people. Well, over the years, God has done that. And um, something I learned, there's something I learned um, in all my years of ministering, that if you are a leader and you don't love the people of God, you really have lost your value. You're really of no value to the kingdom. And I learned how to maintain the love the love of the love of the people and to guard to guard and, and safeguard that love because I realized that if I didn't love the people of God I had I was no place with God I was no place with God but that that principle is not only for me that's for the body of Christ you got to love the body of Christ. Well, the Lord insisted, insisted that I be come the minister that he had ordained. And in growing up before Bible teachers, I went through a lot of trials, a lot of pitfalls. Um, but I think the greatest trial of all was that I knew that I had a gift. I knew I had a gift. I've always been a teacher of the Word of God. And I knew that I had this, this gift to teach. And uh, I watched God keep it restricted, you know, keep me restricted with it. And I would look at other ministers and uh, other ministries and other ministers, and they would not have, they didn't have the knowledge of God that I had. And their gift, they, they didn't have the gift of revelation that I had. 
some of them. And, but I saw them, I saw them starting churches, I saw them evangelizing, I, I saw, you know, them working in the kingdom. But God kept me restricted. I was in a church, uh, this was before Bible teachers, I was in a church, and it was very obvious that I was a very good teacher. Um, and one thing I was, and always will be, I was loyal. I was very loyal to my leader. So I would never allow myself to, to be competitive. I knew that would not, was not the mind of God, and I knew it would not be good for the people of God. And... But I also saw that I was restricted. And every time that my gift began to blossom and seem to, to go, there would always be something to stop it. Always. And um, I didn't understand that. And I chided with God. I was most miserable. I didn't know what to do. I was depressed. And I had given up everything. When God called me to preach, I walked away from everything. And when I say walked away from everything, I mean literally walked away from everything. I mean businesses and, you know, things like that. And God wasn't using me. Not to the degree that I knew he could. Oh, yes, he would. If people were going through something, they would come to me for counseling and, and things of that nature. But I was restricted. And I remember, I'll never forget this day, and I believe, I believe my life changed that day. I left my office. I left my accounting office. Uh, one of the accounting, I think I was, I think I his, had a small office on Broward Boulevard, and I left that office, and I was, it was raining. I mean raining. It was raining cats and dogs. It was just raining. And it was lightning and thunder and lightning, and the water was coming up on the, on the road, even on the road, and, you know, if you was walking in the road, the, the water would be up around your ankles. It just was raining that hard. And it was lightning, and you could see the lightning, like, touching the ground in some places. And I left that, I left Brow Boulevard, and I had to be about probably a half mile from my house. And I started walking. I had a car, but I started walking. And I walked in the rain. I mean rain, so rain, that, so much rain you can hardly see yourself. And... Um, and it's like I had a death wish, you know, and I'm, I'm saying to God, I said to God, I said, you have your foot on me. My father, my earthly father would never do me like you're doing me. And the Lord spoke to me and said, I love you more than him. I cried and I walked. I heard him, but I cried and I walked. And I got on the street where I lived. I could see my house down the street. And I said, you have your foot on me. And the Lord said to me, you're not getting up until you d decide to do it my way. If you don't do it my way, you'll never get up. Now, I hadn't, I didn't have a church. I 
I've left everything. To preach the gospel. And the Lord is saying to me, except I do it his way, I will not get up. And I knew, I knew that that wasn't going to change. I knew that, that what God had said wasn't going to change. He wasn't going to change anything he said to me. I knew I had to change. I knew that if I wanted to be a minister that was ordained by God, not just a minister, because I could preach the word, and I knew I, I could draw a crowd, I had a name in South Florida, people knew me as a great teacher. You know, I was one of the best teachers my bishop had. And so I, I knew, you know, how to do that. But I wanted to be sanctioned by God. I wanted to be sanctioned by God. Because I knew that if I wasn't, first of all, the end of that would be hell. If I wasn't sanctioned by God, if I wasn't doing what God had ordained, I knew that at the end of my life, I would probably end up in hell. I was sure I would. So I wanted, I wanted a ministry that God was in. I wanted a ministry that God was directing and that God was leading and guiding. I wanted a ministry where God was actually talking to his people. That's what I wanted. And God knew that in my heart. He, there are a lot of things that I've come to understand now that I didn't understand then. But God knew in my heart, in my heart, I wanted to please him. And I wanted to serve. I just wanted to serve. And I didn't care about anything else. Did things change immediately? No. But one day, I prayed a prayer. Many prayers. Uh, I, was, I, I was very depressed, so depressed until I was suicidal. And I remember, I remember sitting on the bed in my bedroom, and the, the door to the bathroom was open, and I could see the John. And on the back of the John, lying on the John, was a pack of razors, single-edge single, single blade razors. You know what that is? That men shave with, you know? I saw these razors lying. I saw that, that, that razor lying on the back of the john. It was a, it was a single edge razor. And I, I was sitting there and I said, I'm going to get that razor and I'm going to slice my wrist. That's what I'm going to do. And uh, I said, but first I need to call my mother and tell her to come get my kids. Uh, I had all this thing planned out. And that's how depressed I was. And that was a that was demonic. You see? Nevertheless, it was real. And I remember my God. I put a there was a song playing on my CD player, and it was Tremaine Hawkins, Never Alone. Some of you might know that song. And somehow it just kept playing over and over again. And saints, the Lord blinded me to where 
when I when I got up to get the razors, it wasn't there. I didn't see it. It was it wasn't there, and I looked and looked and looked, and it just wasn't there. Somehow it just wasn't there. I don't know whether he he miraculously caused it to disappear or whether I was blind to it, but I didn't see it. And um, the Lord said, you do it my way or you won't do it. And my life changed. That night, I agreed with God. I said, I don't even know what your way is. I just know it's holy. I know you're holy. I may not even understand everything about your way, but I know you're holy. I said, and if, if that's what it means, I'm willing to be holy. I'm willing to be holy. I said, but anything else I need to learn about leading your people or, or learn about loving your people, you got to teach me. Because I don't know. You got to teach me. And the Lord took me. He took me at, at my word. And he began to teach me. He began to teach me ministry and what real ministry really was. The Lord said to me, he said, I'm sending you to my people, to the church, just as I sent Moses into Egypt to bring my people out of bondage. I'm sending you to the church to bring my people out of ignorance. I'll never forget that. That's my mission. My mission my measure is to bring the church out of ignorance. Now, in the World Conference study guide, I make mention of a fact that something God said, that over the years he has given us many truths that have, been a, that have become a contradiction to the lie. You, you can be very, you can attest to that because, because when you sit and listen to certain things, you know that's not, it's not the truth. And that's because you know the truth. There are many things that you know to be the truth. Well, the contradictions to the lie is truth. And the Lord told us years ago, he said, the lie can only flourish when there is no truth. And the Lord said he was going to bring about the unity of the faith. And I said to the Lord, I said to him, I said, you have given me an impossible task. I can't do this. I don't know how to do that. Your people are so, your, your people don't believe. They're, they're, they don't believe you. They're certainly not going to believe me. And they're so scattered. They're in all these different denominations and all these different doctrines. How are you going to bring your people together? And the Lord's answer to me was, I will exalt truth. I'm telling you this for a reason. I'm going somewhere with it. Just bear with me. Sometimes we need to remember what God has already said. He said, I'm going to exalt truth. And he said, my sheep will hear my voice. And another, they will not follow. Now that's the sheep. The sheep will hear the voice of the chief shepherd. And they won't follow another. Now, the, everybody in the church is not sheep. Everybody in the body of Christ is not sheep. But the sheep are going to hear him. The sheep are going to hear him. Now, where are we right now? First of all, Let's talk about why. Why is it that you can testify 
that you have truth, you are listening to truth, that you don't hear hardly preached anywhere. And, I, and, and, and this is not to pat me on the back or big me up as you say in Jamaica. This is just the truth. I don't turn on the television or radio and hear some of the things that God has said to us on a daily basis. Just don't. But why? Why? Does that mean that, that Mary Banks is, you know, she's just smart and, and, and she can read the scriptures and, and come up with stuff that other people can't come up with? I don't think so. In fact, I know that's not true. But the reason that we have enjoyed revelation is because of apostolic order. And I need you to really understand what apostolic order is. It's not about me being the boss. That's not what apostolic order is. But apostolic order is a fulfillment of scripture. It is aligning, it is being in line, being aligned with the design of the church in the scriptures. To be aligned with that. The church in the scriptures were founded by apostles. And they sent out evangelists. And even deacons who were evangelists. These people went out and they started churches. But the, the revelation that they preach was the word that was given to them by the apostle. Because it was the apostles that God gave the revelation to. Right? It was those 12 men that knew the heart and mind of God. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 3 that, that this this revelation was given, the, the revelation of the mystery of Christ was given to the apostles and the holy prophets. So now, without apostolic order, without having a real apostle, because apostolic order simply means that there is a real apostle, not someone that appointed himself as an apostle, not someone that has got tired of being a bishop and then put a label on their name and say they're an apostle, but someone that, is, that was actually sent, because the word apostle means the sent one, especially sent by God, personally sent by God to do a specific word, to, to do a specific work, rather. And the, if, you don't, if you have a real apostle in place, if there's a real apostle, that apostle is hearing from God. And what that apostle preaches comes straight from God. The way God would deal with me in the early days when I was raising up uh, that first and second line of ministers, God would speak something to me. He would say something. And I would tell the ministers, God said thus and so, go find it in scripture. And that's what, that was their assignment. They had to go, go find that. I said, God said it, so it must be in scriptures. And they would go find it. They find the principles and the, the sayings in the scriptures. And God had me to do that because God was making a statement. He was making a statement. Now, let me say this. Whether, it doesn't matter who does not believe God? That does not make his faith or his design ineffectual. It's going to be as he has designed it to be. The reason that we have fresh manna is because God established apostolic order. That means that he put an apostle in place that he could feed the truth to. It's the responsibility of the apostle to take that word and install it in the church. That's the difference in him and the prophet. The prophet, he can, he can take bits and pieces of this word and he can prophesy it. 
He can prophesy this word. Uh, uh, prophets are not people that run around saying, I see, I, uh, you know, I see God got a house for you or God got this for you and all that stuff. That's, that's, that's not the prophetic ministry. The prophetic gift confirms the word of God. And, and uh, that doesn't mean that a man is not a seer, uh, but, this, but to be a seer means that you see the heart and mind and the purpose of God and futuristic events that God is going to do to, to bring forth his word. So when you have that apostle in place, it has nothing to do with who's the boss and the this and that and all that stuff. Glory to God. It has to do with the order of God. God, he said, I put in the church, I said in the church, according to, according to 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, 28th verse, he said he, he set the apostle first, secondarily the prophets, then the pastors and teachers and evangelists. So now... That's the order of God. That's his order. And I need Bible teachers to understand that the reason that you are receiving what you're receiving, you're receiving fresh manna from heaven because of that order. Do you understand that? It's because of that order. It wasn't, be and, and, and let me tell you something. It had nothing to do with me. I did not do that because I was the number one opponent to apostolic order. I did not want to work this way. I did not want the responsibility of churches. Give me one church, and if, if there are other churches that came out from under this, okay, fine. You know, you can be associated with us, and, you know, you do your thing, I do mine. Because that's what I learned. That's what I saw. But God said, that's not my way. There are no such thing as long ranger churches. And when you have a long ranger church, you're going to have a long ranger revelation. And the people can only grow so far. And I think that one of the things that you all must be very mindful of, you ought to be very mindful of uh, since you've been here, since I've, since I've been here, uh, two and a half years now, you should be able to look and see that you've grown. I can see how far you've grown. And you, can't you see the change in your own life? Amen. You have grown. You have changed. Uh, and and what, what is that change? You're not getting richer. Some of, some of us are poor. <laughs> Come on. Some of us had more two and a half years ago than we have today. Hello? Amen. Come on. So, so when we say you're growing, we're talking about spiritually. And when you grow spiritually, you're coming, you're coming into that, that place that God has designed for you to walk. And something else that you need to be very mindful of is that you're enjoying it. Come on. You're enjoying it. You know, when I first came here, I was almost scared to walk through the door. I didn't know what you guys were going to do to me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> God. You know, all these, you know, these tight faces and, you know, and people looking at you, judging you. And hmm, what's she going to say today? You know, <laughs> you know. It was, it, was, it was rough going, but I said, I'm going. I'm going anyhow. Glory to God. The, the, the scripture told me, don't, don't look at the faces. Don't look at the faces. Just keep preaching. Just keep preaching. Glory to God. And so that's what I did. I just kept preaching. And, you know, in the midst of a whole lot of stuff, you know, a whole lot of junk. Y'all know. Amen. But I just kept preaching, kept preaching because the Lord instructed me in Primus. He said, go to Jamaica and strengthen my people. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. He said, you go and strengthen my people. And so that's what I did. I came and I knew the only thing, glory to God, I told Primus, we're sitting in the house and I said, Primus, he said, Doc, what's, what's the course of action? I said, we preach the word. I said, we, don't, we, we stand flat-footed and preach the word. Because God said the word is sufficient. So if the word don't do it, we can't do it. Glory to God. I watched God change this church. I 
watch God change you. I watch God mend, mend things that were ripped. Marriages that were shaky, he began to pull them back together. Hearts that were unsure, he began to settle them. I watch God do that. Bre breaches that were in relationships, even, even people, even relationships with me. I saw God begin to bring those relationships together and gel them. Then I watched you grow spiritually. And then I watched, I watched as you developed a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. I watched as you came through the door, glory to God, smiling now. Glory to God. And, and glad to be in church. Come on, somebody. God had to do that. Only God could do that. So what did God, what, what is all of that for? What is all of that about? What is it about? What is God doing? What is he doing? Everything that God has ever taught me and in, the, in raising an apostle, you learn, you learn, I learn, that there is a, a, an inbred, I guess, in the gift of the apostle. Uh, how can I say this? I have a gift to train people. I can train. I can train people to do what it is God wants them to do. That's my gift. And up until now, I noticed that I, I, I watch God. I watch how God does things. And the first order of business in this ministry was to get the people on the same page with God. To bring the people out of whatever was their impediments, whatever was holding them, whatever was their stumbling blocks, to get the people out of their disparity, out of the things that were holding them hostage or holding them captive, to bring them out of that and bring them to where God was. That was the first order of business, to, to cause you to see God and what his heart is and what his mind is for you. That was the first, that was the first order of business, to, to get you to see God. You need to see God. I needed you to see God. I didn't need you to see me, I needed you to see God. And to, to cause you to see him and to know him, that was, my, that, was, that was my mission when I came to Jamaica, to cause you to see God in a way that you had never seen him, to, 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 to make sure that you had a personal relationship with God irrespective of me, and that your relationship with God, amen, could, could, could flourish without me, to make sure you knew him. And I believe that we have accomplished that. I believe that you're seeing God for yourself now. Come on, somebody. And I believe you're beginning to like what you see. And, 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 and one of the things that, that, that I really wanted to accomplish, one of the things that I really wanted to accomplish here was to, to, to get you to believe God. I wanted you to believe God because that's the thing that changed me. When I got saved, I remember the night, I, the night before I got saved, I said to God, I said to him, I said, I have done everything your word says. You said, be baptized in the name of Jesus. I was baptized in the name of Jesus. Be baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I've been baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And then I got baptized in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Just to make sure I didn't leave out anything. I've stopped doing everything that I know is wrong. And I've waited on you. And if you're not going to save me, 
I don't want to wake up another day unsaved. I want the Holy Ghost. And God saved me the next day. Noonday on a Friday at 12 o'clock, I got saved. Full of the Holy Ghost. I think I was already saved because I got saved when I was nine years old, but, but I was a backslider. I didn't know, you know, I, I didn't have anyone to teach me. So it was just like getting saved all over again. And God baptized me in that Holy Spirit. Glory to God. And hallelujah. Glory to God. And I had this, this, this relationship with God. I feared God. That's number one. I feared him. I feared God. But number two, I knew that God word, God's word could not fail. I knew it couldn't fail because when I prayed, that's what I took to him. I said, I did everything your word say. And you say you cannot lie. Then I have done what your word say. Why don't I have the Holy Spirit? Hallelujah. And so I, my thing to you is this. I want you to believe God. I want you to believe him. I want you to believe God. I want you to believe God in spite of anything you see, hear, or feel. You got to believe God. Whatever God say is law. It is law. Why do I want so much for you to believe God? Because not to believe him is a sin. It's a sin not to believe God. It's a sin. And it's a dangerous sin. Because you cheat yourself out of so much. So much. So where do we go from here? What is God's mind now? What does God want to do now? What is, what is he really saying to us now? God has given us a word. In this last world conference. Before the conference God said. I'm going to give my people understanding. I didn't know how powerful. The doctrine of salvation really is. Or was. But the doctrine of salvation. Is the New Testament. It's the mystery of Christ. It's the whole New Testament. So to, for God to say that my people don't understand salvation. And you don't either. I was shocked. I'm like, whoa. And, you, and my fear was, wait a minute now. Uh, are you saying that we've been preaching wrong? Go, oh, glory. I got scared. I, oh, Lord. I said, now, Lord, who was I listening to? <laughs> you know, because I've been preaching what you told me to preach. And he said to me, he says, the truths that you have have brought much contradiction to the lie. But you don't understand them. You don't understand them. My people don't understand them and neither do you. So now, what does that really mean for us? What, is, what does that really mean? It means that God has a plan for the body of Christ. I told you something a long time ago, and I don't know, some of you might have heard me and some of you may not have paid it any attention. But since God taught me how to pray, I have yet to pray a prayer that he didn't answer. God either says yes, no, or wait. But he does answer. He answers. I prayed and I said to God, I said, you've taken my life. I've given it to you freely, but you took it. I handed it to you and you took it. 
I says, now I only have one reason for living. I don't have any other reason to be in this world. I only want one more thing. My children are all saved. If they, if they don't make it to heaven, it's not because I didn't introduce them to you. But I've taught them who Jesus is, and they know you. They're saved, they're sanctified, they're full of the Holy Ghost, and they're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I've done my job in their lives. I only have one other aspiration, one other desire. And saints, I can stand before God, and I know he's present tonight. And say that that's the only reason I have to live. I only got one reason to remain in this world. And that is, I asked the Father to let me live long enough to see the word that he gave me turn the body of Christ back to him. I want to see the hearts of the sons turn back to the father. So, I don't have any other reason to be alive, Julia. No other reason. I don't want anything from this world. I don't want anything from this world. What do I want from this world? There's nothing here for me anymore. Absolutely nothing. And I need you to understand that. I need my ministry, the people that I'm raising in God, to understand that you have a leader that doesn't want anything from the world. That I am content with whatever state God leaves me in. You do have that kind of a leader. And I want you to believe that. I want you to believe that because that's precious. That's precious. It's precious for me. And it's good for you. It's good for you. Because when you want something, you're going after it. And whatever you have to use to get it, you'll use it. If you really want it bad enough. And I have seen so many preachers take advantage of the people of God. One of the things that God gave me, I am so grateful to God. Because one of the things that God gave me... <coughs> was people in my ministry that love and trust me. You'd be surprised that most pastors don't have that. Many pastors don't have people that genuinely love them. You have a lot of people that are men pleasers. But I'm talking about real love. People that are concerned about you. People that have, that, that carry you in their heart. But God has to put you in people's heart. And so when, when God does that, you can't betray that. You can't betray that. So I don't have, what else do I need? I have, I have a, if, <laughs> I never go hungry as long as one of you got some food to eat, I'm going to eat too. Isn't that right? Okay. <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> if I need a ride to go someplace, as long as we got cars in the ministry, I can go. Huh? If I need a shelter, a roof over my head, as long as some of you got a roof, I got a roof. So what else do I need? Uh, what else? You see. So... The only aspiration that I have left now is to see the hearts of God's people turn back to him. Now, the Bible says this, and, and Jesus is my mentor. That's, that's my mentor. Jesus taught me everything I know. But I know Jesus taught me. Flesh and blood, there's no flesh and blood on the planet that can take credit for the revelations that God has given me about himself. There's one man that raised me 
in holiness, and that's Bishop R. Grissett, and I give him credit for 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 teaching me holiness and 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 making me want to be holy. But the revelations that God gave me came from God. I know God. I know God. God is my friend and I'm his friend. I will never be God's enemy. I'm his friend. And I want that knowledge that God has given me. I want the entire body of Christ to experience it. Now, God has instructed me He has instructed me to go to the body of Christ. This is nothing different than what he told me years ago. Nothing different. He said, this was, this, I will go into nations and carry this gospel. Well, he's still saying that. He says, same thing. We're in some nations, but we have not scratched the surface of what we're about to do. The Bible says this. Through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he said, No man attempts to build a building and don't count up the cost. You count the cost. Well, him being my mentor, I got to follow his example. I'm counting up the cost, and I know what it's going to take. I know what it's, what it's going to take to evangelize nations, starting with this one, starting with Jamaica. Because God said Jamaica was the prototype. And if, if, and if God didn't intend for me to start here, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I wouldn't be here. But I'm here because God wants to start right here and reveal to us what he's going to do in the entire world. Right here in Jamaica. Hallelujah. That's something to be, that's something to be glad about. Hallelujah. So I'm counting up the cost. What does it take? What does it take? What is it going to take? For us to evangelize this nation and the other nations. You have, a, you have a slogan here, out of many, one people. Well, that's God. <laughs> out of many, one Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one body. Out of many has come one. It's no, it's no coincident that God chose Jamaica. It's no coincidence. Glory to God. It's no coincidence. And there, and there's, and, and there's some, some, uh, you know, some people on, on the other side that, that, that uh, may, you know, get a little envious. And, you know, because, you know, and there's some on this side in Jamaica that are very arrogant about it. You know, you know, you guys are very arrogant. You know. But nevertheless, God's plan is sure. What, you know, that doesn't change what God has intended. Regardless of how we respond to it, it's still God's plan. So God has sent me here. He sent an apostle. He sent an apostle. And that's what I need you to understand. He sent an apostle that could be, I, glory to God, I could be in Texas, Spring, Texas. I have a, I have a, 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 a church out there, a ministry out there, a building out there that is at least three times, three or four times the size of this one. It takes up half of an entire shopping center. My sanctuary is bigger than this one. My, of, my office is half the size of this, my own office. I could be out there, you know, sitting like a big shot or something, you know. But that's not what God required. God required me to be here. 
Why? Because God wants to do something in this nation. Now, I'm going to tell you something, and you can believe this or you can choose not to. But if I tell you God said something, write it down. You'll see it happen. God spoke to me the other day. And he said the most important thing in this ministry in Jamaica right now is BTBN. He said because that's the platform he's going to use to evangelize the nations. Not just this nation, but the nations. Because God is going to take all of the gifts and talents that he has in Bible teachers and he's going to put it on there. You haven't even seen BTBN yet. But you will shortly. It's about to expand itself greatly. God is going to put all his, his word, he's going to put his word on there with different people. And that word is going to be exalted. It's going to be exalted. God said he's going to give us a great mouthpiece. Hallelujah. We're going to have a great mouthpiece. And out of Jamaica is going to come a word that will change the entire body of Christ. Now, Habasa. Now, God said this some time ago that I want you to see how God is bringing all of this stuff about. Years ago, God called us. He put a label on us. He put a label on this ministry that he's about to bring to pass. I am, I'm ecstatic. I can't, even, I can't even articulate, find words to articulate how I really feel, saints. I am happier than I've ever been in my entire life because of what God has said to me. Uh. God has say, put a label on this ministry years ago. And you know what that label was? Reformation. He called us a reformation. And when, we, when I told the, the, the church what God said, you know, they said, oh, yeah, oh, praise the Lord, we're reformation. Ooh. <laughs> and it was just, uh, uh, you know, it was just another word. You know, just, just something we could call ourselves. Oh, yeah, BT is a reformation. Nah, nah. No, you know, but nobody really believed we were reformation. <laughs> you know, that was just something, a new title that we had. But God is the one that called us a reformation. God called us a reformation. And, <laughs> and I remember saying to the Lord, I said, now, nah, you know, Okay, you, you say we are reformation. Reformation means reform. It means that we are going to change something. Come on, Clover. It means we're going to change something. Isn't that right? Amen. Glory to God. It means we're going to change something. And God said that we are a reformation to the body of Christ. We will change the church. The church you see now will be impacted by the word that God has given us. Yeah. Yes, it will. They will, the, 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 I want you to think about the last three or four weeks. Think about the last three weeks, the, the word that you've received the last three or four weeks. And how, I was at the World Conference. I, I was there. And uh, I, I, <laughs> I preached every session. And at, at the end of that conference, I looked at those people and I didn't, some of them I didn't even know. That word changed people right there. Right there on the spot. People were changing. People were changing. There are some people that got changed at that conference that will never be the same. They will never, ever be the same. This word has changed some of you for life. You, you'll be changed, you'll change for life. You'll never go back to where you were. Never, ever. Hallelujah. There's no way to go back. 
Come on, somebody. If you really heard Jesus, you know, the scriptures say, if you have learned Christ and have been taught by Christ, we were taught by Christ. Come on, somebody. Jesus. We were actually taught by Christ. And saints, let me tell you something. I wondered, I said, God, God, what is it going to take? What is it going to take? Why? I'm preaching, <clears throat> I'm preaching so hard. <coughs> I'm preaching, but my people are still struggling. Why are they struggling so much with sin? Why are they struggling to believe? God, what's going on here? Am I not making the trip? And I began to question myself and question my gift and question everything. And like, why is people still struggling? And God said, my people do not understand. They do not fully understand and neither do you. But I'm going to give them understanding. And saints, I've got witnesses here. The kids that live with me, Anesta and Yannick and Daniel and Kareem. We were, we, we were, I was, I would take this word and I would throw it at them. And, and say, go write this, go write that, and go write this, and go write that. Just to see, how, were they getting it? And let me tell you, we all, we were sitting there, we were sitting, we were sitting in my bedroom, and they were sitting around the bed, and, and we all kind of looked at each other, and Kareem said, or Yannick, one of them said, this word has a life of its own. It has a life of its own. And we kind of looked at each other and we knew that we were changing. This was before the conference. We knew that what we had heard <coughs> from God had changed something in us. And I was so glad to see that change in them. Because they were my guinea pigs. And, uh, <laughs> and I said, wow, this word has impacted them. Great. And uh, I saw it changed me. It changed me. I'll never be the same again. What does that mean for us? What does that mean about, for global evangelism? I wondered over the years, you know, we was always saying, well, you know, I think we think this is it, this is it, this is it. This word is so powerful. God gave us faith and we just jumped, leaped for joy when we understood faith. Then God gave us Lord teachers to pray and we leaped for joy when we heard Lord teachers pray. Then God gave us be ye perfect. And boy, we sure enough shouted with that one. Amen. <laughs> All along the way, truth about suffering, all these things, you know, comprehending the land. We were just rejoicing. Oh, boy, we got it. We got it. Got it. But I said, God, we still on hold. And God showed me how we were in his quiver. We were hidden in his quiver from the world. And from the church world, too. <laughs> but I didn't understand something. This was the missing piece. What did God do at the conference? God filled in the gaps. Come on, somebody. He filled in all the gaps. See, you can say, be ye perfect. But if any preacher, hallelujah, if any preacher truly listens to the salvation message that the scripture teaches, there's no way that that preacher can come out of there with sinful nature. No way. So you don't have to, the word itself, you don't have to um, fight a false doctrine. The word has destroyed the doctrine of dual nature. The word has destroyed the doctrine, the doctrine of sin with grace covering it. The word has destroyed all of that. So what was it that God was doing? God had a set 
time. I don't know why God didn't tell us this 20 years ago or 25 or 30 years ago. I don't know why. God knows what's going on. He, know, he got his set time for everything he does, and I don't question it. I just follow along with him. But this is the time we have received a revelation of Christ in the church. And I was sharing with, 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 with Pastor Leverage how I have a privilege. I'm enjoying a privilege that some of the other apostles didn't enjoy. God gave Paul this revelation. <laughs> and he gave it to me. A revelation of Christ in the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What is Christ in the church? Peter said, Paul preached things that's hard to be understood. Glory to God. Because God gave Paul a revelation of Christ in the church. John saw him coming down through 40 to, to 41 generations and beginning that 42nd generation. That's what John saw him. John had an eagle eye just like they say Ezekiel had. John saw, glory to God, Jesus from, amen, from the Godhead, amen, bearing record in heaven as the word of God and coming to be made manifest in the flesh. But glory to God, Paul saw him in the church. He saw him in the church. And because Paul saw him in the church, Paul is the one that wrote the last, the 14 books of the, of the New Testament. Paul wrote those, those, those epistles. Glory to God. He wrote them. And what are they about? Christ in the church. Christ in the church. And that's a revelation. Why, why would one man, one man that was even born out of season, one man that didn't even walk with them, wasn't even a part of the original 12, but, but God give one man the charge of writing 14 books of the New Testament. He didn't give that to Peter. He didn't give it to James or John. No, he gave it to Paul. He gave it to Paul. Why? He wasn't even one of the, the 12. Why? Because God gave him a revelation of Christ. And that's what Paul was testifying. He said, because of the abundance of revelation, the messenger of Satan was sent to buffet me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's why it's so important. That's why God installed prayer every three hours in Bible teachers. I'm probably one of the only pastors in the world whose name is called before the Lord every three hours of the day. Every three hours, my name is called up before God all over this ministry. That's why God installed that. Because years ago, a prophet a prophet that had a trite record, had raised the dead several times, prayed for me. He said, I need to pray for you. He said, because that devil is mad with you because you have stepped into his headquarters and he is angry with you. And he told me, he says, from henceforth, you take one day a week, do nothing pertaining to the ministry. What? <laughs> Oh, Lord, I should have said that. <laughs> he said, one day of the week, don't do anything that pertains to ministry because the devil is going to attack you. He wants to destroy you because you are in his headquarters. And he, you are a threat to his kingdom. Now, this was years ago. And, and, and see, when people lay hands, I don't just fall down like some folks just fall. You know, you, I, you know I'm glory to God. <laughs> I'm not falling all over the place, especially on national television. I was on TBN at the time when this man prayed for me, and I hit the floor. Glory to God. He laid hands on me and poof, right out. Glory to God. But I knew that was the Lord. And now, because of this revelation, the devil is starting to buffet me. I mean, really, really buffet me. But that's okay. You keep calling my name up before the Lord. You keep calling me up. Amen. Amen. 
So how does this, how does this, where do you come in at here? Where do you come in at? I said something to Bible teachers years ago, and this, 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 this expressed my heart um, and the mind of God. God is not raising up one man shows. You don't want no one man show. God didn't raise up Bible teachers just so Mary Banks could be the big dog. That's not what God's intent is. God's intent for this ministry is for there to be a group of people, a people, a people, a nation of people that are walking in the spirit and are performing and demonstrating the presence of Christ. That's the purpose of this ministry. He's not raising up celebrities. He's raising us to be servants. So where do you fit? Everybody in this ministry that is born of God, and if you're not born of God, it's time to get born of God. It's time to get there now. It's time to stop procrastinating, glory to God, and let's get there. Because God wants to use every one of us. Every one of us he wants to use. And, he's, and, and I want you to be careful how you hear that. I want you to be careful how you hear that because you, you've heard people say God want to use you. Has anybody ever told you God want to use you? Anybody ever told you that? God want to use you? I want you to evaluate when you hear that. Because it's true, but I want you to evaluate what you think that means and what that means to you. Because there's a criteria for serving God. There's a criteria for serving God. And when God informs us that he wants to use us, okay, most people think in terms of if God is going to use them, he's going to use them either to preach or teach or, or pray for people and they get healed. They're going to have all these gifts, you know, operating and stuff. And, and, and God is going to, you know, basically they, they associate God using them with exhortation. Somehow they're going to be exalted. You got to be careful with that because if, 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 um, if God wants to use you, it's going to be because you diminish. You diminish. Do you understand what I'm saying? Self diminishes. Because you, you must be decreased so that he can increase. So when we have that expectation, God's going to exalt me. No, God is going to exalt Christ. One of the things that God said when he first called me to Bible teachers, he said, I'm going to tell you today, my people are not going to follow you. They're going to follow me. And as long as you follow me, they'll be there. He said, my people are going to follow me. And so that's why it's so important that flesh doesn't get in the way. That you, that you do not see yourself as being exalted and becoming synonymous, that exhortation becoming synonymous with God using you. Because when God, when, when, when God say, I want to use you, it means that he wants Jesus to work through your body and let Jesus glorify him. Because God is only glorified when Jesus is performing. That's when God is glorified. And so let us not get the big head because God say he want to use us. Amen? Praise the Lord. What does God want to do? God want to take this nation first. He want to prove something to you. He want to sh put his handiwork on display. So what does that mean? That means that, that means that God is not going to exalt 
and put on display a bunch of sinners. He's not going to do that. But God is going to raise up. And that's what he's doing right now with this message he just gave us. Separating the, 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 the sheep from the goats. Yes, it is. And God is going to raise up himself a people, a people unto himself. And pastors after his own heart. Yes, leaders after his own heart. God is raising up a people that, that, the, that the people in this nation can look at and say, that's my church. That's my church right there. The, this is salvation. Hallelujah. So now, that has to be grilled, discipled. Jesus discipled his people, right? He discipled them. You have to have that in your spirit that I am here to glorify God. I am only here to let Jesus work through this flesh. This flesh belongs to him and he wants to put himself on display. Now, the scripture also says something. Is There's a principle in the scripture that says, how can two walk together except they agree? How, how, do, we, how do you walk with, with Apostle Banks and you don't agree with the message? Someone was talking to me the other day and they said, well, Doc, you don't let me do this and Doc, da, 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 da. And he said, oh, I know why, though. I know why, because I don't believe in that perfection thing you, te you teach. <laughs> and um, I didn't say anything, but, but he was right. <laughs> Amen. How can we walk together except we agree? There's going to be some dissension. And, and where we are now, saints, let me tell you something. We have some, God has, I'm looking at what God is doing. God and, and, and I want you to take note. Take note of what God is doing. Look at what's happening. Okay, all of you, how many people in here are in no form of leadership? Raise your hand if you're in no form of leadership in the ministry. Raise, raise your hand high if you're not in any, you're not in it, you're not a minister in, the, in this ministry. Just, just raise your hands. I want to see. You're in no form of leadership in the ministry. Okay. That's going to change. But anyway, um, I want you to see the people that are leading you now. I want you to take note. I want you to take note of these pastors. I want you to take note of these pastors and some of your deacons. I want you to take note of how they've changed. Do you see a change in them? Can you really see a change in them? I do. They're changing. They are changing. Jeanette Day is changing. Come on. Jeanette Day is changing. Yes. All of that. And see, this is something that is so personal to me. Because... I'm, <laughs> there's a, some things that I see have happened in the church that I'm determined not to happen in my church, right? One of those things is young people are oftentimes overlooked. And I make sure that they're not. Because if you don't catch them at a certain age, you're going to lose them. Amen. And, and I don't want to lose any. And these young people come to church, they're hearing the same word we're hearing. We need to treat them as a part of the church. And, and get them saved and get them working. And so I do a lot of focusing on the young people. And I try to make room for their gifts and, 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 and put them busy. Making them do things for the Lord and, and, and discipling them. And, and causing them to love being in the household of faith. That's what leaders are supposed to do. But then at the same, by the same token, there's some people that have been here for years, like a Jeanette Day, that have so much in them. It's time for it to come out now. It's time for it to come out. It's, it's time for you that have been here for years.
Amen. It's time to come out. And one of the things I don't want you to, I don't want, I don't want you to, to let the enemy speculate about. Sometimes people say, well, you know, uh, Doc is close to the leverages and she's close to the Normans and those are the people that she's going to use and, you know, and this and that and that. That's the devil. That's the devil. Because, let me tell you something. Let me show you something. There is no way that George Leverage would be doing what he's doing in Bible teachers right now had he not changed. Amen. Come on now. Amen. Amen. But because the word changed him, now God can use him. Amen. Amen. And use him in a real way. Amen. Glory to God. And so and that's the same thing. I, I, I look at, um, I, and I see so much. I see so much. I, see, I look at you guys, and you think I don't know you. You think I don't know you spiritually. Some of you think I don't even like you. But, <laughs> but, 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 but I look at some of you, and there's so much in you. There's so much in you that has not been tapped into. It hasn't been tapped into. And, uh, and it's time now. It's time now for, for whatever's in you to come out now. And that's my job. My job is to bring it out. I look at people like Pauline. Pauline got a lot in her. Amen. Pauline got a lot in her now. Amen. She got a lot in her. Yes. And, and, and me, and Paul, me and Pauline done went head up. You know, we, been, we done went head to head. But we found out something. We love each other. Pauline has a, has a, has a heart. She has a heart, and, 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 and I saw her heart, and I saw what God want to do with her. And I'm going to fight for that. I, I'm the one that will fight for that. I'm going to fight for that. Amen. And there, there are so many of you. Now, this, 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 so many of you that God, God has, um, Wayne, I, I, what is your name, Sir. Dale. I was that Wayne? Dale. When the Lord when the Lord selects people. See. See, I watch you. I watch your spirit. And I see, I hear God speaking to you. And I hear the devil speaking to you. And I hear your heart saying to God. And I heard you say to God, I'll be patient. So God is rewarding that. He's about to reward that. He's about to reward. Jesus, hallelujah. He's about to reward that. Because you stayed when folks tried to get you to leave. You stayed. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. And God is going to reward that. There's so many of you that have so much in you. Our chairman deacon, Michael Pentecost, got so much in him. He wants to please God and, 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 <laughs> and he's never really been given the chance to, to fully flex his muscles. So I, you know how they move, you know how People move me in on the chessboard or checkerboard. I kind of moved him over here as a chairman deacon because I want him to flex. I just haven't given him the weights yet. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> well, it's the truth. You know, you have, to, you have to put a little weight if you're going to develop the muscle. You got to have a little resistance there, a little weight. So I put him in the place and let him feel his way around a little bit, and now I'm about to give him the weight. So there's so many of you. There's so many of you, and, and, and some of these young people that you may not, you may think that, that you, you're being overlooked. No, you're not, and you're not forgotten. We got a plan for the youth. But I want everybody in this ministry, um, Bev, amen, so many of you have gifts that we don't, we don't entertain. But I want you to understand something. That gift is here to be developed here. 
it may not be to be used here. Do you understand? This is where we develop it at. Glory to God. Hallelujah. This is where we develop it at. Now, now you will see the real Mary Banks come forth. You'll see me do what I do best in discipling leadership. Discipling people, amen, preparing them for leadership. Preparing them to be those disciples of Christ. And that's everybody in this ministry. That's not just the leaders. Yes, we will have private sessions for our leaders, but we will have deep discipleship for everybody. Everybody. And so I, I want everybody to, to gear up and gird up. Gird, gird. <clears throat> gird yourselves. Gird yourself up and be prepared be prepared for the things that God is about to train you to do. Because it's my job to discover and to pull forth the ministry that is in you. Before I go any further, are there any questions? Or Pastor George, you have any comments? Or Pastor Sam? Any questions? God has a plan for this nation and we're going to attack it. We're going to we're going to impact this nation from from several different directions. You know, um <laughs> someone called us years ago a secret storm. You know, a secret storm is on you before you realize it it was a storm brewing. We're going to attack Jamaica from several different avenues. Um The young people, we're putting together, I, I, I met with Bishop French all day the other day, uh, we're putting together a crusade team. A team of, we, we want several crusade teams, we want more than one. So that we can have crusades here throughout Kingston Brownstown, Ocho Rios, Mandeville, and Montego Bay. That's where we're starting at first. We want to do crusades. We want more than one crusade team. This, this crusade, these crusade teams will involve all of our young people, especially, because they, they, the young people will be the attraction they will be an attraction that bring in people and some of them will dance, sing, preach, whatever. Uh, but we also want several conference teams. And what I'm going to do is prepare conferences. Now, this is something that God gave me to do, was conferences. God gave me conferences, a conference team. I'm putting together a conference team for myself. But I'm also putting together other conference teams. And what I want is I want to train teachers that can do fast tracks. And I want them done all over this nation. I want, them to take, I want you to take this. I'm going to do the first one. Then I want conference teams that can take this message, that can take this message in fast track form and take it into other churches. You know what I mean? Take it into other churches. Take it into other areas. Amen. Not only here in Jamaica, but throughout the Caribbean. So we, I want to put together conference teams that can do that. That will consist of teachers that can do it. Um, the Lord let me know that you, it, we got to use all of our resources. And we're going to spread out, glory to God, we're going to spread out like this with, with conference teams, with crusade teams, and with lifesaver teams. Lifesaver teams, crusade teams, and we're giving the young people, you know, carte blanche to be creative, to get out there in the streets, wherever we can. We're going to block, we're, block, we have, we're planning a 
crusade down in Ocho Rios. They're going to take the town square and just block it off. Amen. And we're going to take all of our young people down there and, and uh, let them do what they do and, and run a cr crusade on the streets. I want them preaching on the streets. I want people getting saved on the street. Michael has already started to do it in Leesburg. My, my niece, uh, uh, now, now watch this. Lisa Thompson preached on the street. Lisa is a, is a 29 year veteran in this ministry. But then my niece preached right next door the next night. Gigi, yeah, young Gigi, she preached. And, and, and the next day, the, the, they, that was on Saturday, Sunday, this lady came to church and said that she, was, she wanted to commit suicide, but she was opened her window and heard the message that Gigi was preaching. And it made her want to come to church the next day. Amen. So, amen. So that's, that was God. That was God confirming confirming what, what we're supposed to be doing. This message of salvation, we cannot sit on it. We cannot sit on this message. We got to take this message to the masses. We can't sit here and wait for them to come in here. We got to take it out there. So, so any churches that will let us in, will come in. Now, for a long time, Bible teachers kind of stayed to itself. But now God is saying, go out. He's saying, go out now. And so if churches what, that will allow us in, we will come in and we'll bring this message. And so we're going to seek it out now. We're going to seek out those churches. I'm going to lay the, lay the, groundwork, I, the, the groundwork. I'm going to organize. We got a, cruise, we got a, we got a, a fast track. I'm going to do the first fast track. I'm, I'm taking this message and putting it into trying to concise it into a one-day fast track to where we have four sessions and try to capsulize it in four, four sessions. And um, so I'm going to do the first one here on the 27th of September. It's going to be here on the 27th of September. We're going to try to invite every pastor that we can find. If we don't find a location for it, amen, if we don't find a location for it, we, it's going to be right here. And, but we have to find that if we're going to have it other places, we got we to gotta, we gotta find a location like tomorrow. We got to lock something down tomorrow. <clears throat> but we're going to do, do fast strikes, and I, I want teams developed. I don't care if I get 10 teams. But I'm going to train every one of them. I want, them all, I want you all trained in this message, in this message. We're going to go out. You know, one thing the Jehovah Witnesses did, when you met a Jehovah Witness, they were ready for you. When they came to your house, they knew what they were going to say. And nothing you said was going to change them. I want my people trained like that. I want my people trained like that. I want you trained like that. Um... Cooking lady. Delores. God has not forgotten about you. He wants you to focus on this. Cut away. Cut some ties. Cut them. Focus on this. This is where God going to use you at. This is what God want to do, which he want to develop you. And you have a heart.